Hi everyone, welcome to the inaugural session of the Deep History and Science in Conversation series. This is an initiative of the ANU's Research Centre for Deep History and the Rediscovering the Deep Human Past Laureate Program under W.K. Hancock Professor of History, Anne McGrath. These sessions are curated by myself and Miriana Unikowski, and we're PhD students within the ANU School of History and the Research Centre for Deep History. Now, as anyone within CAS and the School of History can likely tell you, history is arguably the most promiscuous of disciplines. There's hardly a methodology, philosophy, framework, or discipline safe from history's embrace, and the offsprings of these transdisciplinary encounters are the various historiographies that continue to evolve and enrich our understandings of the past. It's with this tradition of interdisciplinary collaboration and communication in mind, we put together this series, which we've dubbed the Deep History and Science in Conversation Seminars. Now, there was a time that science considered itself a natural history, and in recent decades, historians have embraced the sciences, writing environmental, medical, big, and deep histories that seek to grapple with agents and timescales well beyond the historian's traditional purview. And we see these sessions as our contribution to this conversation, a conversation that in these troubling times seems more important than ever, as it provides a broader and evolving perspective on the human past and its interrelationship with the natural world. Our inaugural session is entitled Pandemics and the Deep Human Past, and it's an attempt to understand the times we find ourselves living in today by increasing our understanding of the role of viruses and bacteria in the deeper history of humanity, human society, and of the earth itself. In order to do this, we sought scientists, virologists and epidemiologists who could share with us their insights into these matters. And I'm pleased to say that we've been thrilled by the enthusiasm of the respondents to our invitation, and it's my pleasure to introduce them to you all now. Opening our conversation today will be Maya Adamska, an Associate Professor and ARC Future Fellow in the Research School of Biology at the Australian National University. Her research uses calcareous sponges to gain insights into the evolutionary origin of a variety of key developmental processes including segregation of germ layers and axial patterning of embryos and adults. She's also interested in major transitions in animal evolution, such as the emergence of multicellularity and morphological complexity, which is why we've asked her along today, and we're absolutely thrilled to have her, so thank you, Maya. Following Maya's presentation, we'll hear from Simon Reid, an associate professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Queensland. His research focuses on finding information that will improve the control of major zoonotic, and that's animal to human for the layperson, and other infectious diseases. He's an advocate of the One Health Approach, a collaborative and concerted transdisciplinary and international program with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes through the recognition of the interconnection of people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. Simon is the co-convener of the One Health Special Interest Group of the Public Health Association of Australia, and his research focuses on the development of One Health strategies to control leptospirosis and other zoonoses in Fiji, Q fever in Queensland, and to improve infection control and veterinary practices more generally. We're very pleased to have him with us today, and thank you as well, Simon. Following on from Simon will be Associate Professor Justin Denham, who is the Medical Director of the Victorian Tuberculosis Program. He's also an infectious diseases physician and an ethicist, and is actively involved in clinical and public health, tuberculosis research and supervision. He's a senior staff specialist at the Victorian Infectious Diseases Service at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and principal research fellow in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Melbourne. He's published research around clinical management, epidemiology, tuberculosis genomics, diagnostics, and multi-drug resistance. He was a very enthusiastic respondent to, a respondent to our initial invitation, and we're very pleased to have him with us today. Following on from Justin will be the W.K. Hancock Professor of History and the Director of the Research Centre for Deep History, Anne McGrath, who will briefly respond to our guest presentations with thoughts and insights into its relationship to our Laureate program. Um, before we open the floor, so to speak, to questions from the audience. Now, in that regard, a few brief housekeeping notes before I pass over to Maya. Your questions at the end should be typed into the chat tab and directed to Miriana Unikowski. And Miriana will then exercise some level of curatorial power and select questions that she'll then handball over to Anne. And the idea or the hope is that the conversation should flow pretty naturally from that with your questions working as prompts for our guests. That said, this is the first of these conversations that we've run and the format is somewhat still up in the air. 
We initially imagined these sessions as a literal conversation between one scientist and one historian, but I was so enthused by the responses I received from these three highly respected scientists that I kind of threw that format out the window and now here we are. So each guest will speak for 10 minutes, which should leave us around 15, 20 minutes at the end for your questions. Now, Anne is our representative historian in this scenario, but you're all participants in this conversation, so please don't be scared to ask a question if you have one, but equally, don't be offended if your question isn't asked, given that we're only gonna have a fairly short time frame and the very high caliber of our panel of participants. I am, of course, assuming that by now everyone's fairly familiar with Zoom, but if you are having any troubles with the interface or you know, don't really know what's going on, feel free to message myself or Julie Rickwood and we'll try and troubleshoot any issues that might come up. Now, I think that's everything. So without any more fuss, I might pass over to Maya and Maya can begin her presentation. Hi, Dos, and hello, everybody. Uh, I am really delighted to be part of this, uh, of this conversation today. Uh, I was somehow surprised when I was asked to be part of that, and then I thought, well, actually, I spent a lot of my time thinking about human past, and I also spent quite a lot of my time thinking about interactions between animals and bacteria and sometimes viruses. So maybe I can provide with my uh, very... Uh, personal perspective on the topic. So what I'm going to do now is I will be uh, sharing uh, my screen with everybody. And that way, because I am a biologist and I really enjoy sharing images, uh, I will be showing you the, a number of drawings and some photos of animals and, uh, and viruses and bacteria and so on. All right, so with that, I will be sharing my screen. And I hope that will work. This is the first time I'm giving an open presentation through Zoom. So far, I've been teaching. OK, so I'm an evolutionary developmental biologist. And basically, I am a biologist that thinks about development and evolution. Uh, and what I thought i will start with is a view of a developmental biologist or evolutionary developmental biologist on humans. So if you ask me what humans are made of, uh, I would tell you that they are humans are made of cells. This is uh, because I assume there are some uh, historians here who do not look at cells all day. So I'm going to run you briefly to what I teach my first year or second year students. So this is a cell. Uh, each cell has a nucleus in it. The nucleus contains the genetic material, our DNA, uh, and approximately 20,000 genes. Uh, the nucleus is in a cell that is that has a lot of other elements, including mitochondria. Uh, we will be talking briefly about them later. They are responsible for energy in the cell. And there is also a lot of elements uh, in the cell that are responsible for transcribing the DNA to RNA. That is the intermediate between the proteins of which uh, cells are made of. All right, so why am I telling you that? It's because when I think of animals, and or even even when I think of humans, uh, I think of the fact that they are made of approximately four times 10 to 13 cells. That's quite a large number. And these are categorized to over 400 types. And you can think of those different cell types as neurons and muscle cells and epithelial cells and so on. So when I think about uh, where animals or humans come from, uh, I wonder what, where do, how do cells know what they should be? So all cells in your body have the same genetic material with minor uh, exceptions for some cells involved in immunity. But all those cells have to express different genes out of this common set of 20,000 genes to give, the, give them the identity. The cells need to not only know what they are, but they need to know where they should be. It's not really good if you are a skin cell, but you are somewhere in the heart. So you need to, as a cell, you need to get to the right place. And most importantly, what I think about is how did this complex system evolve? So where do humans come from? So the way to think about it is we can think about animals that are related to humans. And of course, you would think probably about uh, more complex animals like snails and butterflies and so on. But from my deep 
developmental, evolutionary developmental biology perspective, they are quite close to, to humans. So the next animals I like to think of are corals. So here is a little piece of a coral growing in a tank in the research school of earth sciences. And if you think about the coral piece, you can, you can look at this and there is a polyp. And if you think about a polyp of a coral, it has more or less the same elements as your body. It has the digestive system, which is green here in the polyp and in your, your gut is, is shown here in the stomach. They do not have a brain as we have, but they have a nervous system and a nerve net that is mainly surrounding the mouth of the polyp. Now, the next animals and the animals on which I mainly work are sponges. They also have cells involved in digestion. They are inside here, they are drawn green and they are, but they have no nerves. So they are definitely simpler and they are definitely more ancient. So I'm not a paleontologist myself, but we biologists derive a lot from uh, paleontology work. And what we know is that animals originated approximately 600, 540 million years ago. And one of the most beautiful examples of uh, fossils that are showing very early animals, some of them looking a bit like animals living today and some looking very unique, are, can be found in Southern Australia in the Flinders Ranges. And people like Mary Joser from uh, California and Jim Gelling from Southern Australia work a lot of those and they have described this unique and fantastic Ediacaran fauna that is very, uh, that, that the best site to see is uh, Southern Australia. And this Ediacaran fauna evolution has been followed by Cambrian explosion about more people know approximately 400, 400, 540 million years ago. And from this time on, all animal body plants that we know uh, are known. All right, so where, where do sponges come from? When do animals come from if we know that sponges are first? So we know that the nearest relatives to us as animals uh, that are not animals are protists called coanoplagellates. They look very much like the cells that are inside of the sponges and they look quite similar to the cells that look very much like uh, the cells in your gut. They have all the cells look the same, they are colonial, some of them are single cells, and none of them have any cell differentiation. But we know both from molecular phylogeny work and from gene content work, and also from their morphology, that they are our nearest living relatives. Now, the nearest relatives to animals and coanoplagellates are fungi. And you can think of fungi both in terms of mushrooms, the champignons you would put on your pizza, but also single cell fungi, some of which we are using to make wine or bread, and some of them that are also uh, might be pathogens for humans. So a lot of us think about them. Uh, so we know that all those organisms are quite closely related to each other. Now, there is also a lot of other animals, and maybe I should, I, I should stop here and say that all those animals and uh, protists and fungi, and also quite a number of plants uh, and amoebas and so on, we refer to them as eukaryotes. And the term means that they are cell, that they are all made of cells with nuclei. Whether they are single cell organisms like some fungi or multi-cell organisms like uh, animals, they all have cells and each cell has a nucleus and the nucleus contains the genome uh, in form of the DNA. Now, if we walk even into deeper history of, of uh, life on Earth, sometime approximately 3.5 billion years ago, and kind of the, the far deep in history we go, uh, the less certain we are of, uh, of the time scale, uh, evolved organisms that are called prokaryotes. That basically means they are organisms that are made of, made of cells, but which do not have nuclei. So if you look at them, there is DNA inside of the cell and there is a membrane around it and there are ribosomes to make proteins, but there is no unique nucleus. There are two groups of those organisms, bacteria, including cyanobacteria, which are bluish green and they can um, photosynthesize as plants do, and archaea. And the reason why I'm telling you about it is because you can still, so you can still see living fossils, kind of remnants of the, uh, of what was what life looked before animals evolved or eukaryotes evolved. This time you would have to go to Western Australia 
and you can see those stromatolites, which are organisms, compound organisms made of multiple cyanobacteria and bacteria that are alive today in this very salty water where other organisms cannot live. You can also, we also know that organisms like that lived 3.5 billion years ago. And again, there are fossils in Western Australia in the Pilbara region. So again, Australia has, uh, has fantastic fossils to tell us about this very, very early uh, origin of life. Now, one of the very cool things about bacteria and archaea is something that has been uh, hypothesized for a long time. There was this symbiosis hypothesis uh, made by Lynn Margulis um, quite, a, quite a few decades ago. And now we are more and more sure that the way that eukaryotes, so organisms that are made of cells with nuclei, evolved is by a symbiotic relationship between bacteria and archaea with the archaeal cell, similar to what is referred to now as Asgard archaea, they are pretty cool, large archaea, so organs similar to that, uh, taking in alpha proteobacterium that became its mitochondrium, and from this, eukaryotes evolved. So this is a pretty exciting, exciting thing to think about, that eukaryote cells have evolved from two independent lineages that started living together. All right, but we are all thinking about viruses these days. So you probably would expect me that after I told you were bacteria and archaea, uh, when they evolved, how eukaryotes evolved, you would probably expect me to tell you where do viruses come from and how did it evolve. And I am quite, uh, quite sad and disappointed, but I cannot really tell you that. And this is not just because I haven't studied hard enough, but simply because nobody knows. Well, there would be people who would tell you they know where viruses come from, and some of them are probably right, but there is a number of opinions. So I have picked those three uh, hypotheses that are well uh, established in the field. One thing that you need to remember about viruses is that they are not cellular. They have genetic material, either in the form of RNA or DNA, but they cannot reproduce themselves. So in contrast to bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, a virus needs a host, which leads us a lot of time to discussion whether viruses are truly alive. But whether they are truly alive or not, the question is where do they come from? So one idea is that they are escaped genetic elements of the cells. If you think about selfish genes and transposons and things like that, some people would think these are uh, viruses evolved from cells that evolved before. Another one is that viruses are reduced cells. In other words, they were parasites. And then because they were parasites, they lost a lot of elements that they previously used for reproduction. And then finally, there are people who would say that viruses were first, that they really are living fossils, and that they somehow were able to live before cells evolved. I will not take any sides, but what I wanted to tell you is that viruses are associated with all other organisms that are alive on Earth. There are viruses associated with bacteria, bacteriophages. There are viruses associ associated with archaea. Now, archaea can live in a very unique environment. Some live in approximately 80 degrees salt uh, hot pools. And there are viruses that live on archaea or in archaea in these conditions. There are viruses of fungi, there are viruses of protists, there are viruses of sponges, there are viruses of corals, and as we all are painfully aware now, there are viruses of humans. But this is not the whole story. If you really start thinking about the viruses that are associated with humans, you also have to think about the fact that it's not just viruses that are associated with humans. Now, I have originally told you that human bodies are made, are composed of these four times of 10 to 13 human cells. But now I should really add that in addition to that, there is also just as many bacterial and archaeal cells. And with all those bacteria and archaea come their viruses. So there are viruses that live with us because they like human cells, but there are also viruses that live with us because they like the bacteria or archaea cells. And finally, there are also some fungi that are living on us. The entire system, biologists refer to as the holobiont. 
So we don't think of individual animals or plants anymore. We think more in terms of very complex systems that are interdependent. And in all those complex systems, each element performs a function or is occupying a certain niche that the other organs are making for it. And probably if, even if you are not a biologist, but you are reading news, you know about the good gut bacteria. Some of them you are supposed to be able to get from other humans when you are born. Some you might be able to get from yogurt later on. We know those bacteria are important for a variety of reasons. There is something called the hygiene hypothesis, which tells us that people nowadays have a lot of autoimmune diseases, allergies, and so on, because we became too clean and we are not getting enough bacteria in our lives. And then there are some more exciting things like uh, the fact that the proteins that are used to build your placenta, uh, they are derived from viruses, viral proteins that are part of our genome now and nowadays. So I would like to end with that by telling you that when you think of yourself, think about yourself as a, an ecosystem, as a system built of human cells, bacteria, fungi, viruses, archaea, and so on, and about the fact that viruses and bacteria have been moving from one organism to another and from one host to another, and we have been evolving in, in this very complex environment, and we are also environments. And I think maybe that is one way of to looking and understanding the pandemics. And basically, pandemics are nothing new. We are part of the pandemics in a way, but of course, that doesn't mean that we don't need uh, solutions for, uh, for human health. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I'm looking forward to hear about viruses from people who know much more about them than I do. That is a fantastic introduction. Thank you so much. And now we go straight on to Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Uh, just, yep, yeah, okay. I can just share my screen. Okay, I'm just sorry, putting it on slideshow. Maybe Josh can nod when it happens. That's all good? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne, and thank you, Maya. That's um it's it's a fascinating segue because uh, we we end really thinking about humans as part of or humans as an ecosystem in themselves, and in some ways. What's interesting then is to look at humans as part of the ecosystem um, more broadly. And, and so my task today was to sort of talk about zoonoses or zoonotic diseases. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I enjoy history, and, uh, but I'm not a historian, but I did decide that we had to put some Greek in. And there's, it's interesting because the articles that I was sent on deep history talk about um, the fact that humans create this anthropognostic view of the world. Um, and really what we're talking about with zoonotic diseases and obviously the, the pandemic we're now passing through, they are zoonotic, but so zoo with animals, um, gnosis disease, but this is an anthropognostic view because essentially it's not necessarily that it's us and them, it's, it's we as a collective sitting in an ecosystem. And to some extent, I mean, I didn't um, put any transitions on so you can read ahead on the slides, but the next fact, factoid is this, this number. So somebody's um, estimated the number of pathogens that humans or that are capable of infecting and causing uh, disease in humans, and there's about 1,400 or so. And about nearly 60% of them are or were zoonotic. And so were is important because not all of them can now transmit back and forth between animals and humans. And I guess what it shows is that humans have an, an incredible capacity to take on pathogens and bacteria, viruses, other microorganisms from their environment. Um, my uh, original training is as a veterinary scientist, and I can tell you that there are no other animal species that have collected up so many pathogens from other species. You can, you can have uh, different animal species sharing the same habitat, 
and they generally don't necessarily share that many pathogens. Um, so it's very interesting to look at it from the point of view of what's different about humans that makes us capable of taking on others' pathogens. Um, and then we have this concept of emerging. So we're sitting in an emerging disease crisis, that's the pandemic, and emerging or re-emerging is, is a term used to describe change. So it's either a new disease or it's a disease that's changing or it's become back and changing again. Um, and some examples of zoonotic diseases, I mean, there's, as you see, there's 60% of 1,400, but in, in Australia, so the ones that we probably most of us will know, Ross River virus um, is a seasonal problem. Um, we don't really know the exact host and most likely it's not one, but you know, you can, you can isolate the virus from different mammals and marsupials as well as horses, as well as birds. So, but it's a complex life cycle. And so this is an Australian virus that we've now exported to the Pacific and it happily circulates in Fiji where there are no marsupials. Um, salmonellosis, so this is food poisoning, most often associated with eggs and chicken. But again, we're talking about food system and salmonella can infect multiple species. So, so the, the association there for humans is it's our behaviors around food and our practices that lead to the, the risk. Uh, and then the final example, which is a, a local one for us, is Hendra virus. And, and again, this is quite a, a rare but very fatal um, disease in humans. But really what it shows is that um, with um, uh, these diseases, that they are not new in, in that, um, they're not new to the ecosystem, they're new to humans. So Hendra virus and other um, viruses similar to Hendra virus circulate in flying foxes and bats quite happily in the same way that coronaviruses circulate quite happily in bats. And these are very old um, uh, relationships between the, the natural host. And what happens then for humans is that we intersect into the life cycle and it's a complex system. So um, in terms of Hendra, it was a, a, it's the sort of um, collision between horses, flying foxes, and then humans that causes um, the disease or, or leads to human infection. And humans have a large part to play in that system uh, in terms of how the ecology of flying foxes um, is disturbed, how that uh, leads to exposure of horses and humans. Um, so some of the initial questions that were posed were more about how. So how do zoonotic diseases occur and how do they impact human society? Um, and I guess I'll briefly go through this because it's not the biggest question to me. And, and so this was a, a sort of a schematic that was um, published a few years ago, and it's a really quite a nice way of looking at it. Um, and what it really shows us is that it's, a, it's actually quite a long process, um, the emergence of disease. Um, and, and there are not all viruses. So rabies, for example, on the left-hand side, Rabies has never really emerged out of um, its canine hosts because it's quite a difficult virus to transmit. It requires deep intramuscular transmission um, injection. Um, and so it has a, a sort of an ecological niche, but multiple species can become infected. So um, the disease itself doesn't really fit the profile of a disease that can emerge. If we look at um, some recent emergences like Ebola, that was again something that, that emerged, had limited transmission in humans, and then uh, has disappeared out of the human population. Um, diseases such as dengue and HIV are, um, are much more established and now really are human diseases incapable of translating back into the animal host. So this is sort of how they, the, the diseases emerge. But what's important is looking at why they emerge and and to me, this is the, the link that we get into with, with history. So this table shows the, the top 10 associated factors that were um, identified through an extensive systematic review of um, papers and studies on disease emergence. But you'll see the top two are the, the probably to me, to my mind, um, well, possibly even represent the rest of um, 
the remaining eight. But really the top two are the, the critical part when we're looking back in the past because um, you know changes in human demographics drive changes in land use. Um, so essentially, uh, in, in my way of thinking, that all emerging diseases and most infectious diseases of humans um, result, are a result of human behaviour, practices, cultures, um, the whole sort of mixing pot of what it is to be human. If we are going through a period of higher risk for disease emergence, we really only need to look at our, our own societies to understand where the drivers come from. And what's interesting, again, looking at history, is that we really have begun to collect up these um, pathogens uh, over a very long period of time, basically all of human history and even prehistory. Um, so, you know, as soon as we began to exploit animals in one way or another, we began to collect um, viruses and different pathogens. Um, even from just beginning in terms of predatory behaviours, um, then we go through the various phases of human civilization. So most people will be vaccinated against pertussis, measles, mumps, rubella. So all of these uh, are thought to have zoonotic origins. Um, and in terms of pertussis, anybody who has a, a dog probably has it vaccinated against kennel cough, which is um, the putative origin of, of pertussis, the bacteria that causes pertussis and whooping cough. Um, the same goes for measles, mumps and rubella with a, an origin in, in a disease called rinderpest in livestock. Um, and as a, a historical aside, it's the only other virus that's ever been eradicated from the world. Um, smallpox is the first in humans, rinderpest in cattle um, is the only other virus that's been eradicated. So. Um, What's interesting, I guess, in terms of our modern history is that we've entered a phase where we are um, urbanised and industrialised. And so the interactions we now see are with those species of animals that we are most closely related to. Um, and across history, you know, the, the um, domestication of animals. So firstly, with um, animals like dogs through to cattle and other ruminants is you can understand the, the growing intensity of relationship between the animals and the humans. So when we look at commensals, commensals are those things that live around us and that we interact with, so bats and, bats and rats basically. And, and that's really where we're seeing most of our um, emerging diseases, but it's also where 70% of mammal species come from. So I, I look at the why then as, as a bit of a narrative. And, and so my sort of favourite narrative around emerging diseases is the, is the Great Plagues. Um, and there's a very nice discussion about London and the plagues in London. Um, and the, the question of, you know, it sort of explains to me a, a really nice uh, explanation of why we're seeing problems now. So the plague is a, a bacterium that... Um, is naturally in fleas, um, rat fleas, and basically uh, it causes a great deal of harm to the host of um, so rats as well as um, people. And fleas don't mind who they feed on, so if their rat host dies, they will jump onto the human host. So that's the how again of, of how the disease occurs, how transmission occurs. But the thing about plague is that it actually is an economic story, um, and London in the sort of, um, there was a period in before the 1600s where there was a couple of hundred years of economic development. London became the centre of all trade uh, in Europe. And it was also a, an overcrowded, um, poorly, you know, with poor infrastructure and a walled city. And with economic development in just about all human civilization comes an uh, increase in the amount of protein that people eat. And so that, in, that protein is part of a status symbol to say that you are a wealthy person. So there's a strong cultural desire as well as a, a nutritional desire to eat more protein. But protein in the sort of um, medieval times required you to have living animals inside the walls of the city. So we had living animals, the food that animals need to eat, and then the waste that's generated. That then generates um, rodent plagues, uh, and all you then need is the introduction of the bacterium. And then if you look at London as a society, 
there was a lot of poverty around um, with overcrowded um, slums around the walls of London and a lot of movement of people and, and things. So when the plague started up, it moved at a very slow pace of about two miles a day, but that was the pace of commerce. That was the pace of an oxen cart. So um, it's, it's a, a, I guess, the, the medieval equivalent of where we find ourselves now. And then if you look at the, the where it comes and the why it comes, it was again all about trade. So there was some nice work done to demonstrate how pulses of plague bacterium were sort of moved from the east to the west into the Mediterranean through the Silk Road and through trade. Uh, and, and this is mainly around uh, you know, the movement of trade and goods across overland routes. So these pulses occurred through um, trading activity uh, and then basically seeded the major cities in Europe. So if you look back then, you can really look at it as an economic story and one that then parallels beautifully into our modern times. And the first time I visited Guangzhou in China, my colleague who was a parasitologist said to me, uh, out of the blue, he said, SARS is fascinating. He said, it's all about economics. It's all about money. He said, uh, we've had 20 or 30 years of sort of um, economic boom in this part of the world. Uh, that then led to uh, a boom in the wild animal trade because people wanted to eat exotic meats. It was a very strong cultural driver in Cantonese people to demonstrate their affluence through what they ate. And he said, that's basically why we ended up with um, the, the wildlife um, markets that were unregulated leading to infection in humans. Um, it's interesting, actually, I put this up, I looked at this today, and the same sort of, um, I guess, conspiracy theories were probably around in 2003, but I wasn't aware of them. So in some ways, human nature, we keep, it's like Groundhog Day, we keep going back to the same, same topics. But I guess the, the sort of final point is that, um, as Maya pointed out, you know, we, it's not the first pandemic we've had and it's not the last and, and, and it probably won't be the biggest. I mean, if you look across time, the largest pandemic was the Black Death. They estimate about a third of the population of Europe died, but we still live with a pandemic that hasn't been eradicated yet and that is HIV. So HIV is another zoonotic disease. Virtually all of these um, are zoonotic diseases of one form or another. So what's, I guess, important for us to look at from a point of view of modern humans is how is the rate of uh, emergence has accelerated and I can only really think that uh, the rate of human demographic change and the rate of land use change is also accelerated um, so you know really the ecosystem can't cope with nine or ten billion humans and all the things that humans like to do but anyway thank you and I'll uh, I'll finish there and uh, thank you so much. Absolutely amazing. And that last diagram really got me. That's a bit of an eye opener. Um, okay, so now we go straight on to Justin. Thanks, Anne. And um, look, I, I do want to start by just thanking all of you for inviting me to be part of this meeting. Um, I know everyone says that at the beginning of their talks, but as I hope you'll hear from um, the things that I, I'm going to say this, uh, today, uh, getting ready for this discussion has been really helpful for me on a personal level. Um, we've all heard some fantastic big picture reflections from Maya and Simon. Um, and so I thought that I'd bring things into a closer focus now and just reflect on a few ways in which uh, I feel like deep history has offered me um, a coherent narrative as I've been grappling with um, not one, but three pandemics in my work uh, in the last week. So for context, uh, I'm an infectious diseases physician at the Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, and an epidemiologist at, uh, here at the Doherty Institute. And normally most of my work relates to tuberculosis. Uh, but like everyone else right now, uh, I'm pretty overwhelmed by COVID-19, uh, which really is a disease that didn't exist six months ago. Um, that means that uh, I, like uh, lots of others I work with, have spent the last few months in preparing hospitals and setting up research programs and fever clinics and lots of video conferencing like this. Um, so it's all been pretty tiring and I, I've realized that I've found myself very focused on uh, small and immediate tasks. 
Uh, and the success of physical distancing in Australia uh, and this invitation today has, has really meant that I've been able to pull myself back from that immediacy uh, and start to think a little more broadly about the context of this pandemic and, and reflect on how I want to engage with it. So this week uh, on my ward rounds, uh, my team of junior doctors brought me to see uh, a young man who had a fever who'd been working on a dairy farm. Now this kind of thing is uh, bread and butter for infectious diseases doctors. Uh, and uh, everyone in my team is very used to asking about contact with animals and other risk factors, um, thinking about many of the diversities that Simon's been alluding to. Um, my first question, I think, surprised them a little bit, though, because I, I started by asking them a lot of detail about the type of milking technology that this farm used. Uh, and the reason why I did that is because I was curious about his risk of having a disease called leptospirosis, which is often found in cow urine. For thousands of years, people milking cows have done so by sitting alongside them on a stool. Um, that's very effective for a small holding, uh, but as farm sizes increased, uh, farmers went looking for more efficient ways to milk. Um, over the last 50 years, uh, farms have introduced uh, various kinds of mechanical milking devices uh, of a whole range of types. Um, first cows might walk into sheds and have milking machines attached um, over the years, conveyor belts and herringbone stalls were introduced to speed things up. Uh, and eventually, a system called the, uh, the rotary milking shed became popular here, uh, which uh, in part involves cows stepping onto a rotating platform that's facing towards the center. And the dairy hand then coming and attaching the milking machines from behind each cow. Now, that seems like a really small change in the grand scheme of things. But it's actually really critical because for the first time in thousands of years of agriculture, milking is done from behind the cow rather than from the side. Now, not to be too graphic, uh, but doing this greatly increases the chance that poor dairy hands will be urinated on. Um, and as a result, we saw an increase in the number of people who were getting infected with leptospirosis through milking because uh, economic pressures and technological change is mimicked in different parts of the industrialized world, um, that's a pattern that was repeated in lots of countries. And this increased risk stayed up until 10 or 15 years ago when the um, uh, economic development of uh, milking agriculture meant that they moved towards bigger and bigger farms, fully automated milking sheds, uh, where cows often have radio frequency ID tags and milking machines are automatically triggered. And this then removed much of the contact between people and cows in the milking process. And so that historical association between working for a dairy farm and getting leptospirosis has again faded into the background. The dynamic interplay there between humans, animals, and technology meant that over just a mere half century or so, a, a kind of mini pandemic in dairy farmers came and went almost uh, entirely unnoticed. Now, th that's just a very small part of the story of the leptospirosis pandemic. It's not complete, but I raise it because it has a narrative arc that I recognize, uh, in part because it's happened over a relatively short span of time. For me as an infectious diseases physician, acknowledging that trajectory is really important in this moment because it helps me to locate where I am in that story uh, and where my patient with his fever might fit. One step back from that, the pandemic that I spend most of my time working with is, is tuberculosis. I'm here, I also see individual people who are sick, uh, but as the director of the Victorian Tuberculosis Program, a, a lot of my focus is on how we might locate ourselves and how we might respond to the story of tuberculosis on a population level. Now, tuberculosis also has a narrative arc, but it's much harder to appreciate at first glance because of the longer time frame over which that's unfolded. Um, so what is that narrative arc? Well, tuberculosis is also a pandemic that's intimately connected with humanity as a part of nature and with um, substantial influence from the technological and economic impact that our species has had on the world. Genomic studies of tuberculosis uh, point to co-evolution of humans and the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, organism and its predecessors from uh, before 70,000 years ago, uh, but with special expansion around seven to 10,000 years ago, closely linked to the domestication of animals. 
for a long time, we assumed that TB was a zoonotic disease, a disease of cattle that had crossed into humans. But more recent genetic data suggests that actually humans spread an early form of TB to cattle and goats, and then gradually to a wide range of mammals, including antelopes and marine mammals. Um, in a development that I find really fascinating, while TB's origins are African and spread largely via Europe, a form of TB was already in South America uh, prior to European settlement. And the specific strain of that uh, organism was almost certainly carried across the ocean by migrating seals. Relatively stable disease patterns uh, were seen through the medieval period, but then the modern explosion of the tuberculosis pandemic which uh, I didn't see on, on uh, that uh, graph of your assignment before, but has, has claimed more than a billion lives uh, over its long history, derives from the Industrial Revolution, uh, with increased population density in cities, close working environments, lung damage from, uh, from pollutants, malnutrition and poverty, leading to huge increases in susceptibility and transmission. Um, the discovery of the tuberculosis organism in the 1880s did very little to reduce the burden of disease and the, the impact of the infection on, uh, on society and culture continued in full force. In countries like Australia and in Western Europe, we really only started to see a significant falls in TB incidents in the post-World War II period. Uh, again, linked to improved living standards generally, particularly housing and nutrition, uh, and then continued after effective antibiotics started to become available really from the 1960s here. Um, by the 80s, we uh, assumed that progress towards TB elimination would occur. Um, and, but then this was unexpectedly derailed by a combination of uh, defunded public health services and the advent of the HIV epidemic. It's only in the last 10 or 15 years that we've again started to talk about TB elimination, but now in a much more cautious and considered way, um, as we think hard about the range of tools and structures that we need to have any chance to see the pain and suffering caused by the tuberculosis pandemic confined to history. Uh, some people like military analogies, and they imagine this to be um, a battle that we might finally win. I'm much less that way inclined. When I think about the TB pandemic, um, I think most often about a game of chess with an old opponent that we've played many, many times before. There are familiar moves that I recognize and we have strategies to counter them. But the more I play, the more I realize that uh, my opponent's game is a reflection of my own. And the moves that tuberculosis makes tell me something important about myself and about humanity. It's taught me that giving a person some antibiotics to cure their TB is actually of pretty limited value. If I'm not also able to connect with how migration and financial insecurity and housing and social connectivity have been both part of their illness narrative uh, and how they need to be part of their healing. So coming back to where I started in all of this, uh, with the coronavirus pandemic that we're all embroiled in in one way or another, this feels new and overwhelming, and it certainly does to me, and I'm sure it does to, to many of you. It feels that way, but it's really just the same old game. The lessons of leptospirosis and TB uh, help me to understand that coronavirus comes from our interconnectedity with nature, um, our push for economic and technological progress, um, our, our persistent short-sightedness about decisions that can take decades or millennia to see their full impact recognized. I hope though that reflecting on the history of pandemics like we've been doing today also helps us to remember the things that are, are so central to what it means to be human that we keep repeating these patterns. Um, particularly our desire to be connected to each other in relationships and our uh, interconnectivity with the environment. Um, more than anything, I hope that it reminds us that the most powerful responses to pandemics are, are less about finding a new drug or a vaccine, and they're much more about listening to the infections that affect us, and being willing to change our society in ways that make us all better, 
um, to address those uh, economic inequalities and racial divides and environmental changes that lead to the impact that all these diseases bring. Um, so I'm really grateful for the chance to reflect a little bit on those things today and, and looking forward to uh, the rest of this conversation today. So thanks very much. So thank you very much, Justin. You're making a powerful argument there for the humanities, uh, but more so uh, uh, about scientists speaking with humanities people like today. So I think in many ways that all three speakers have convinced us about the important links and how scientists and historians should talk together much more often. But as Josh said at the beginning, this, you know, um, this is an initiative of a new center for uh, research into deep history, as we call it. And uh, in true historical tradition, we are addressing questions of relevance to the present. Um, and there's that whole thing about history always being of the present, uh, even though it's reflecting on the past and trying to um, draw out lessons for the present uh, through those studies. And uh, some of the key influences on us are people like Dipesh Chakrabarti, who argued for historians to take an interest in deep geological time because we're now living in the Anthropocene. And it forces us to think about how humans have such a huge impact on the environment, such as through climate change. And then, of course, we're also very influenced by um, our collaborating scholar, Dan Smale, whose books on deep history and deep history on the brain uh, reflect on how rarely uh, we look at the big picture beyond biblical history. Uh, uh, we tend to go back to Egypt and we might look at the Rosetta Stone and, you know, ancient history, which is in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but as historians, we, uh, it's hardly surprising because we've started out as a scholarly discipline that focused on the text and in philology, trying to interpret ancient texts. And we still train our students um, in multimedia sometimes today, but it's, it's still very much about critiquing documents. So when we start to look at deep history, as we call it, that goes way beyond the modern and the ancient history, uh, we haven't had the tools. And so Dan Smale has argued that, well, if we work with science, we will learn more about deep, the deep human past, the hominid past. And of course, he points out that we are hominids and that it's not all about what happens in the brain, but there's this whole ecosystem, as the speakers have pointed out, happening in the human body, which is totally related to what is outside the human body. It's interesting to think of humans as hosts to so many other organisms, and of course, to be constituted by these organisms. Uh, and, and historians thought they were making a jump when they started to talk about embodied history and the embodiment of the human, because we had been focusing so much on the rational man sort of idea of causation in history being to do with human decision makers or great men and so on. But embodiment tended to emphasize gender and, and not the kind of embodiment that we've now started to think about in relation to viruses and pandemics. It's the sort of thinking that you've helped um, bring to us today. Uh, but I'd also say that you've made us think about scale from the tiniest little microorganisms and things that may not even really be cells. Uh, and think of the huge scale and those figures that Maya gave us, which I think most historians probably wouldn't understand if they haven't actually studied maths. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to add up how many <laughs> actually are, cells are involved in the human body, I'm sorry to say, Maya. Uh, and uh, and we, t we should understand more of that. And there is that issue with time and we have, a bit of trouble trying to imagine a history that goes back 65,000 years in our own country, which is uh, part of the human history that we know of, uh, but we don't tend to class it as history. We tend to class it as um, some scientific discoveries about ancient Australia or something. Of course, Aboriginal people share stories uh, through history, but I think that um, Historians also need to learn about that past through engaging with scientists, but then through turning it into a what we would call a history, a narrative and an analysis. So there's some of the ideas of where we're coming from. And, uh, and I guess we need to look beyond uh, 
the brain as the point of the um, human decision making and think more about how so many of the big changes in history have been related to these biological interactions which are very complicated which takes me back to that theme of scale of temporal scale trying to think back to when the first uh, corals and creatures on the western australian beach were found and of course you can go to broome and see dinosaur footprints and also these ancient fossils you're talking about and and also hear amazing stories from the europe you are people of broome um, about these um, dinosaurs and the stars and all related um, in their rich storytelling traditions. Uh, so I guess I would like to think about scale, the tiny scale of things operating in the human body, the huge scale of global transmission and the long time trajectory that you've introduced to us. And, uh, and I guess um, uh, you have alluded to the ways in which thinking about deep history might have changed your own thinking, but it'd be fascinating to get a bit of a roundup from the speakers um, about whether you think there are new questions or ways that historians and scientists might be able to work together or think together. Um, so perhaps, Maya, would you like to say something first? And I need to officially say, yes, we're going over time. We will go over time to allow for the audience questions and so forth. Uh, so, well, I, I'm just so uh, humbled by uh, being part of that. And, uh, and I, I think I, I learned again a lot. I, I think the only, the, my only kind of new thought is that we all historians and biologists uh, should be, and all other scientists, should be trying to step out from our narrow fields and kind of have a have a good look. I think we've, we've, I, I really greatly enjoyed what Simon's and Justin's talks because I guess when I think about my deep scale, I think 600 million years. This is kind of my time time scale, and I've been thinking about the yesterday's pandemics. But but seeing it in the full scale, in the continuity, I think this is really um, I think reassuring in a way that that it this is all part of life and that. And I, I really enjoyed Justin saying that we also need to think not just as scientists about antibiotics and, and things like that, but about the, the bigger picture and perhaps influencing uh, or trying to influence decision making, although I'm not sure if this is too naive uh, <laughs> from, from my perspective of, of being able to, to kind of pass what we think about as scientists to people who actually make decisions uh, and be able to make a difference, not to be kind of locked up in the ivory tower, because it's not just us who need to understand what is happening in the world. Yes, um, and it's also interesting about uh, what Justin was saying in relation to the zoonotic diseases, that some of them actually came from humans as opposed to only coming to humans. And that whole idea of coming out of Africa, um, that really does wake us up to deep history. And, but, but then also you look at some of the evidence of these diseases and you do find it in the records of, you, of Egypt and so forth. Uh, so through studying disease, we can gain insights into uh, some similar sufferings that people from long ago had, I suppose, and we can try and imagine how they dealt with it. But I think at the same time, there is this close link between the past and present. So I don't want to imply that deep history is something always long ago, because I think it's still very much with us now and we're carrying a lot of these things in our bodies. Uh, and uh, when we, we drink water, we eat food, um, we're making sourdough. So, uh, so we're all uh, part of <laughs> this complex bio system that we're carting around. Uh, and, and during the pandemic, I guess people are having different interactions with different kinds of bacteria and growth than they normally have, would have in the office too, if you want to look at it on that um, office versus working at home scale. Uh, Simon, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So yeah, just to, I guess, echo Justin's comments and Maya's comments about this experience, it's, it's great. You know, I, I've learned so much uh, moving careers in from sort of animal health to public health. Uh, and now that I've sort of firmly entrenched in public health, I'm learning so much from my colleagues who work more on the humanity side, particularly around governance and policy and some of the sort of ethical uh, and moral issues. And it's fascinating because that's not my background in terms of training. I think, um, you know, Justin could probably relate to the lack of humanity that's taught throughout a clinical discipline in terms of um, you learn all that once you leave. Uh, and, but what fascinates me is, is the fact that history keeps repeating. And as Justin pointed out, you've got these micro cycles or you have macro cycles. And, um, you know, the, the world of emerging diseases is full of these little anecdotes where something, I mean, to me, it's a sort of, it's a relationship between our, our environment and us. Um, so TB and drug resistance is, is the response of the bacterium to uh, an assault on, on their integrity. Their job in terms of their own species is to propagate itself. And it's mm -hmm. fascinating, particularly when you start studying parasites that almost have a brain, you know, collectively. And, and so I, I think of the organisms as another species that we relate to. But there's a couple of comments that have come through. One's about the sort of human environment interactions. And there's a book mentioned on the chat by, um, called Spillover. Now, I, I read another um, a different set of books. Um, Spillover, I guess, sounded more like my lectures. So I sort of struggled to read it. Um, only not because it wasn't good, but just because I that's what I tell my students. And so, um, but, but what's interesting is I became interested again in the Gaia hypothesis um, and this whole thing about ecological balance. And the reason is, is that if you then look at, so if we step outside history in terms of that's an anthropocentric construct, if you look at ecology, ecology uh, organisms, uh, free living mammals suffer the same problems that humans do. Uh, I loved uh, sitting once in a, in a, conference on rodents it was on on rats management of rodents and and rodent disease and they pointed out that you know there's 5,000 species of rodents and only five of them are pests and they're the ones people know and this guy sat and he gave a really nice presentation on on voles these are European voles they're little tiny furry animals and they basically had this, he, they monitored this population and showed a spike in population growth followed by a, tr a dramatic decline. And the cause of the decline was a pox virus. But the pox virus was already present in the population. The only time that it became a, a sort of an effector mechanism for the decline was when the population had outstripped its, its capacity to survive in that environment. And so it's always fascinating to me that you, you see it time and time again that organisms, microorganisms may be the cause of a decline, but they're not the driver. They're not the, they're not the, um, they're the proximal cause, not the distal cause. So if you go back and you look at actually what was the cause and these are the drivers. So I would say with our pandemic now, you know, the drivers of a lot of the, the risk in the food system in China are based on us wanting to buy our iPhones as cheaply as possible and the whole global system of production based on the cheapest product producer. Um, and, you know, I don't want to, I mean, it's, it's an observation, not a political standpoint. But, you know, then if you then say, well, have, have people learned from this? And, and the challenge is, you know, my mother, who was a nurse, a trainee nurse during the polio epidemics in the, mm. in the 50s, uh, and she nursed through two flu pandemics in the, in the um, 50s and early 60s. And so she saw devastating high mortality events. Uh, you know, polio was, was tragedy, um, you know, writ large. And it's interesting because the point of view is, well, it will respond. You know, th this is not the end of the world. Um, the, the world has suffered worse than this. I mean, the world wars were worse than this. Um, and I guess what it shows you is that people working on this now, all of us, me included, you know, none of us have experienced this before. And so the decision makers, don't have living knowledge. They don't have a sort of lived experience to relate to. 
mm. and it's very difficult to bring that in. But if you actually look back through the cycles, you know, I, when I was fossicking around looking at, at laws, because at some point I thought there was a suggestion that English labour law changed after one of the pandemics where, you know, shortage of labour drove up costs and changed society. So it doesn't change humans, but it changes our societal structures and the way we work. But there were comments there about um, the first sort of public health responses in the 1300s and, you know, Scotland closed its border to England. Um, so, you know, you're dealing with the, the equivalent of closing our airports. So, so I think when you actually look at public health responses, they're, they're pretty pragmatic and they're pretty repetitive. And, and you know, the Sydney quarantine station um, is, is a, a, it's a, um, a physical entity that represents um, the management of public health risk from smallpox. So, you know, you know I, I don't think there's much we learned, but what's interesting is it's the context that changes constantly. And so for me, managing these problems and trying to predict and to de-risk society is about learning context. And this is where, you know, Justin's comments about farming technology changing. You know, it's the same in China. You can't just ban live animal markets because it makes the problem worse. So how do you, you know, and the question I have that this is where historians, I think, have such a role to play. You know, how does human society change? How can you make purposeful change in a way that's more predictable and, and long lasting? Because changes in a reactive way are often incredibly messy. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think this is a wonderful, you know, concept that you're trying to get together because, you know, it's, it's fitting several square pegs into different round holes. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you also going back to Justin's point, like, you know, you need to look at things closely, don't you? Because you might think that these particular more mechanised ways of milking cows is going to mean less hu human to animal transmission, you know, so you need to actually look at what's going on and think about it more deeply, which is what historians try to do. But a lot of people do say, oh, history is about change. And, you know, unless there's a dramatic change, um, well, obviously uh, a pandemic is a huge rupture. It's a crisis. So we do expect that a, a pandemic to create change. But at the same time, um, as Justin said, it is uh, much the same as what he's seen before. And also, of course, Maya, um, I mean, you're looking at continuities that have been happening um, in cells and in all living organisms, um, going back millions and millions and hundreds of millions of years. Um, so I can, I certainly, everybody says historians are no good at predicting, but, um, but, but I hope that we're having some impact in, uh, in encouraging more historians to think about medical history and biological history as part of human history. Uh, because certainly historians started to get very involved in environmental history and thinking about climate change and so forth and the impact of the Industrial Revolution and, I, and because of the, the, the threat of the terrible impact of climate change. And now I think because of this very visceral experience that the whole world is having, uh, historians are really going to be wanting to take medical history and um, biological history far more seriously. Uh, and I must say that it has almost been um, um, a side issue in history that there are only a handful of people who I'd say who were appointed as expert medical historians and they tend to be more in history of science rather than sometimes mainstream history departments but I certainly think that'll be changing but we will need to work together but I, I do think you know that idea that history is not only about change but it, it is about continuity is, is also something interesting that we have to take into studies of the deep past, the deep human past. Uh, now I did have, I've got a lot of questions coming through. Uh, so this one is an important one. Uh, how does this current coronavirus context influence the panelists' views on the general global increase in the disruption of nature and its consequences? What does this mean regarding questions of human animal interactions or issues of inequality to name only two areas that this pandemic is forcing us to reconsider. Well, 
Well, I'm sure we could all weigh in on that one in, in different ways. Um, you know, I, I think um, it, it's tempting when we get to a pandemic like this to, um, to think that this is an, in, an unexpected intrusion into normal processes in human life. Like, you know, things just carry along and then, oh, whoops, there's an animal and this disease gets in and this is all unexpected and out of the ordinary. Um, and I think um, a lot of uh, the, the really great perspective that came out in your talk, Simon, was um, around the way that uh, actually these diseases are, they're, they're integral to who we are uh, as part of the world. You know, it's like um, pandemics in a lot of ways to me are, um, they're an emergent property of what it means to be human in our world. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised by them. They are... Uh, they are different, but they are predictable. Um, and so uh, when you start to talk about lessons that we learn, I think probably the biggest lesson for me is around um, approaching many of these situations with more, um, I say, epistemological humility, you know, um, a little less uh, certainty about what the impact of some of our uh, uh, decisions will be, uh, a little less certainty about how we know what we know, um, and being willing to accept that many of the things that we do will have uh, long-term and sometimes unpredictable um, uh, effects. Uh, and yeah, so I, I think pandemics mostly teach me something about humility in the way we engage with the natural world. Yes, well, that's great. Um, there's an, another question which is related and it's talking about the material influences beyond money and status in terms of the origins of illness and responses to the illness. And I think they're particularly interested in um, social inequality. So is there any uh, comment on that? Uh, well, I guess I could have a go. I mean, I'm, I, 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 I a caveat is I'm not a social scientist and, uh, you know, the world of social inequality is something I, com I understand but don't comprehend. I think the issue really is about susceptibility um, and also the, um, I guess, it, I don't know what, it's, it's, it's what priv privilege or wealth can give you it's in terms of protection. So I guess it is susceptibility, vulnerability. The... It's it's interesting, you know, the distribution of disease is is never is never um, um, equal. So generally, the um, less the more vulnerable, you know, the more um, I guess uh, um, susceptible people tend to be the ones with the highest incidence. And and it's it's incredibly complex because it then comes back to just about every illness or health state or even you know educational state of humans it, it all comes back to the human capacity i guess to support those who have less in order for everybody to gain as opposed to a system that um i, I guess considers that to be part of the fabric of who we are and i you know i, I don't know that probably sounds very vague but i mean if you look at um uh, things like Ebola, you know, the, the reason Ebola in 2015 spread so sort of dramatically into big cities is that there was no infrastructure, no healthcare infrastructure that could support people. So you have people who are vulnerable because of their geographic location as well as their, their income levels and, and also their cultural and, and knowledge-based vulnerability because with um, a lot of, um, you know, lack of I guess even even with high education, you can still get a challenge, particularly with infectious diseases. You know that people just don't understand the germ theory. If, you know, to put it simply, I mean, my father was a was an engineer, and he really never understood biology really well. He he wanted to, but he never really understood it. And I think, you know, so that means you've got these multiple layers of, of vulnerability. But the 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 key thing is that that people can buy their way, pay their way out of a lot of problems. And, and, and through history, that's what we did. You know, if you had a country estate in England, you went to your country estate and you didn't get plague. If you were stuck in a slum and you had no other way of moving apart from on your feet, you couldn't outrun the plague. 
you know, you have nowhere to go. And and I think that's the same with us. And and I guess to the to the credit of of the systems that we live in is that there's enough understanding of human um, vulnerability that we then have deliberate policies to protect those who are most vulnerable. Um, you know, in a callous society, we wouldn't have protected the vulnerable because you know we would see them as as lesser and therefore expendable. But a lot of investment was made in 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 um, making sure that we protected our vulnerable. So I think as humans, we go through these improvement cycles. So we get better every time we face one of these things. What's different is understanding how to be adaptable so that we have a plan and, and the plan that we rolled out was a, an influenza plan adapted for coronavirus. You know, how do we do a, a better one next time? Because it won't be the same next time. It'll be something different. And, you know, that's, I guess, the brain that humans have. We can cope with that. There is another question come through. Some vulnerable people are still considered expendable in our society. I, I think that uh, that's an interesting comparison with the polio epidemic because it had such a terrible impact on children. And, and it's been quite uh, disturbing uh, for many. We've got a, a baby um, <laughs> gate crashing. Hi, baby. <laughs> That's right. Hello. <laughs> That's right. And uh, yeah, the babies are very distracting. You do want to say hello to them, don't you? Um, yeah. So it's it's like the older people. They were being told, "We don't need you anymore. Uh, it's okay if you die. Um, you're actually stopping the young people getting jobs by um, having to close the place down to protect you from dying." And which is a dreadful indictment, I think, on our society. And many other societies valued the wisdom of the elders. They valued the terribly important role they played with their grandchildren and so forth. Um, and so I would see that as some contrast with polio. And then, of course, what happened, the terrible um, 80s AIDS epidemic, there was that idea that it was people's own fault because of their sexual practices, which was terrible. And, and in fact, Australia did lead the world in, in um, trying to change that attitude, which is, um, which is a good thing. And I also am quite... Uh, uh, touched by the fact that I had the great privilege of meeting Frank Fenner and of course he was a professor at the ANU and one of the very first talks I gave about deep history little did I know he was sitting in the front in the audience and he is a lovely man and came up to me and and he was obviously a polymath and interested in everything and, and he had a deep interest in, in Aboriginal history I think that's why he'd come he actually went on a trip with Russell Ward, a famous Australian historian out in the bush. Um, I think it was their first real encounter with thinking about Australian colonialism. Uh, but yeah, it's not, I think that the point I was leading to is that uh, we have very short memories unless historians remind us of things that happened in the recent past. I mean, we've forgotten about polio and the huge impact that had on Australian society. I mean, my younger brother actually got it and so did my um, uh, mother's sister, uh, sorry, my great aunt. Um, and so it had terrible effects on um, them. And, uh, and, and then smallpox, like, you know, children today don't even um, need to get the, uh, the vaccine and the t TB. And, and so, yeah, so the point I'm making is how quickly, quickly we forget recent history let alone think of the impact of the very deep human past that is um, a history that's reflected in that fairly recent history too. Uh, I might just read out a couple of interesting quotes that address, address some of the questions. Um, the author Arundhati Roy reminds us, she, uh, unlike the flow of capital, this virus seeks proliferation, not profit and has therefore inadvertently, to some extent, reversed the direction of the flow. So I think that gives us room for thought. And then some of my um, history colleagues also wrote emails with some interesting uh, comments. Um, Gunlog Fur, a colleague of mine from Linnaeus University in Sweden, and of course Linnaeus, we all know, important role in, um, in botany and classification in science. Um, 
she wrote, in my own work on indigenous history, and she's worked on the Sami and the Delaware in the US in particular, um, epidemics have been an ever-present and unavoidable theme and one that has challenged communities fundamentally and recurringly to rethink relationships, leadership, ceremonies, and material practices. And then another colleague, Manuela Peak of Amherst and the University of Ecuador, who's done a lot of work with Brazilian um, and Amazonian indigenous people um, and the great impact on, of uh, extractive industries on their um, environment. She wrote, the pandemic has brought a deep transformation in meaning and it will likely be a different world and humanity once we re-emerge on the other side of it. It will be what it will be when it will be. The time frames of the past are gone forever, I hope. But these types of quotes just remind me uh, how fortunately I think that looking into deep history has become quite timely. And I hope that uh, a lot of the listeners and a lot of the participants who joined the webinar can join us in this quest to understand the deep human past and the deep planetary past uh, much better than we currently do. Uh, we will be having more uh, seminars like this and we do have a website that you, I think the website is just re.anu.edu.au but you'll also see it on your invitation, um, Eventbrite invitation. So we'll be advertising when we have more of these. And, uh, and we will also be posting this for people who would like to see the recording. So we'll hopefully have that ready in a week or so. Uh, but I would like to very much thank the organizers, Josh, PhD student who really should be getting to write his PhD, but instead he's doing all this hard work organizing this wonderful innovative event. <laughs> um, Miriana, who's in the same boat, who is also a PhD student and, and they're both um, a great pleasure to uh, supervise and great members of our laureate team. And uh, of course, to the audience, thank you so much for participating. Thank you for your questions. Um, Philippa Levine from the University of Austin, Texas is someone who's just, she's just written, eugenics, the idea of expendability, live, lives not worth living. Yes, she know, that's her specialization in history. So she knows all about that um, variable ideas of who should be entitled to live and who shouldn't. Um, and we've also got comments about um, disproportionate impact on indigenous people in North America. Um, of this COVID-19 and of course there's terrible fears for the people in the Amazon. Um, it, in fact, it's, it's, some people have said it could be a big genocide. It could be the next big genocide for them. Uh, so I want to thank, uh, to send a very, very special thank you to our three speakers, uh, Maya and Simon and Justin. You did an amazing job. It couldn't have been more apt and more educational for all of us. Uh, but we hope to continue conversations in the future. And uh, we wish you well during COVID-19. And, uh, and yeah, if you want to find a vaccine or a, a cure, we're happy to, uh, <laughs> for you to continue to work on such things with your colleagues. Uh, so I look forward very much to our next meeting. And I hope you might even join us for our next webinar. Thank you, everybody.